Welcome. Wait, am I the one? I'll introduce. Yeah. Welcome yeah, to this sound and scene. Um. Oh God, I screwed up already. <laughs> um. I'm here. My name is Justin. I'm here with uh the matches, uh in celebration of bleeding audio and the director uh, Chelsea Christer. We got we got we got Sean Harris. We got Matt Whalen. We got John Devoto. We got Justin Sansusi. And um, I wrote fifty questions, and then I I asked Rich. Uh, how many does he usually do? Uh oh, wait, is that? Did you hear that? Dang it! How do I shut that off? Okay, <laughs> that's the that's the noise that happens every time you say how many questions you wrote. <laughs> yeah, uh, we usually do six to eight and get through four. So I had to whittle it down to fifteen, and I'm gonna go fast. So here's here's what we got. I'm gonna start with uh, just like an opening statement, and I'm gonna ask a bunch of rapid fire questions. Not really, but kind of. And um, he did it. Uh, so. <laughs> I believe Justin, you can just can you just call me after this and ask the rest of them just over yeah, the yeah, phone? That's sure. a, okay. That's what I want to do. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, I believe the first time I discovered the matches was uh, on the Epitaph tour in 2005. I'm not sure how you feel, but when I was first playing with Motion City Soundtrack, we'd play with bands uh, and exchange albums and shirts, but the music, no matter how good, never really hit me the same as the bands that you know that I grew up listening to. Or maybe that's because I never fully felt a part of the scene that I was associated with. Um, but with the matches, it was different for me. I felt like you reminded me of, of the bands I grew up on, uh, but you were hard to pinpoint. You know, I couldn't really detect like one specific major influence. I detected like several. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and yet I, I did not feel like you were derivative at all of any of them. Uh, and the truth of the matter is, and I'm embarrassed to say it, but I did not understand Yvonne Dahl killed the locals when I first heard it. I think Josh Kane sent it to me and I was like, and then I saw you live and I was like, oh shit, that's what they're doing. Okay, okay. And so I only say that because I want to show you how uncool I am and too many people try to be cool and I'm I'm not. So just want you to know. I listened, I listened to our music and I still haven't had the, oh, that's what we're doing moment. <laughs> oh, so <laughs> you beat me to it. <laughs> uh, but yeah, and then but then you know I I recovered fairly quickly, and then when Decomposer came out, it just blew my mind, and I was I was so upset because like that's the kind of shit I wanted to be doing, but I I just I I couldn't do it. I wasn't capable of it, or I just hadn't figured it out yet. I don't know, but I love that record. Um, I'm already realizing that I'm never gonna get through any of this, so I'm just gonna <laughs> to the end and What's say the like, question, um, man, <laughs> I love you, know, you too. I'm loving uh, this. This is great. You don't have to ask us any questions. Oh, just, 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 yeah, just tell you how much it's, I love you. It's uh, just, it's story time with Justin. Yeah. Uh, but I, our mics over here. <laughs> you know, like, but listening to all like the the three albums, like I feel like, you know, the first one was heavily rooted in punk rock. But it's just weird as fuck. And then De 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 Decomposer was like, um, it could have rivaled all of the, any alternative record that came out between 1988 and 1996. And Abandoned Hope kind of felt like this weird, like uh, like music to a, a musical or a film like that never got made, you know? And, <laughs> and, and, and it's like each thing, like it's, it's distinct yet it is fully you. And um, shoot, I lost my spot. Um, but it seemed like, you know, from an outsider looking in that everything you did was uh, super, you know, intentional and had purpose. But I also understand that fans have a tendency to fill in the blanks, you know, with their own shit. And um, should, should, um, oh, uh, with their own shit. And oftentimes the beautiful thing is they end up kind of shaping the narrative of the band in a way. And, you know, should both band and fans continue that relationship over time. Um, you know, and 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 I guess without a doubt, the matches and the people who love them. Oh, my. our time's up. Thanks, everyone. I know. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the uh, and without a doubt, the matches and the people who love them feel like um, feel like a beautiful fucked up family. That's what I'm. What's a, what I'm getting at? And I think there Thank are you, yeah. very few of us bands and fans that get to have that experience. And I, for one, am forever grateful having had both being in the band Motion City Soundtrack, uh, but more so being a fan of the matches. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that's what I want to say there. And before we get uh, into thanks, questions, man. one Love more you. thing. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm like steamrolling through this, but uh, I, I need 
to formally apologize to Matt for my incredibly offensive impersonation of him in the film. Uh, it was it was wrong to do. Uh, I don't have an excuse. I'm sorry. You know, but to be fair, I only make fun of the people I love, and I love you, Matt. Take it. I love you. It was an honor. It was an honor. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but here's why, because these other assholes in their weird ass clothes and stupid haircuts are all flash because they had no talent. You know what I'm saying? And like, you didn't need to do that. You didn't oh. need to do that. You didn't trick the audience, you know, because you're drumming bar none. Shots fired. There we go. I came because I love. Um, so let's start with uh, let's start with Chelsea. Um, I love this film. I, I think I've, I made a mistake. I've watched it seven times so far. I think I told you it was nine, but it was seven. <laughs> I exaggerated. My bad. Um, but, uh, but in fact, when you first sent me the link to the first, like, what was it, like 10, 15 minutes of the film, uh, I watched it three times and then immediately texted you <laughs> to ask when you can get started on the Motion City soundtrack documentary. <laughs> that's, awesome. That's true. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> To my recollection, uh, we didn't talk for weeks, and the, that question alone sent you into a deep depression um, <laughs> no, that you never recovered from. But never. I, because you picked, I, you picked the wrong band. And... <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I love this film. Like, I, I love it. And Thank I you. Couldn't, I couldn't tell, you know, at, at first I was kind of worried because I was like, I don't, I couldn't tell if I like the movie because I love the matches or if I like the film even if I had never heard of the matches. And my Aww. guess is that it, it is both. It's like, you know, I figured that out. Um, but, uh, da, 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 da. yeah. And oh. for what it's worth, that was intentional, you know, is like, and I think I've talked to you about this too. Um, and, and to others is that, you know, we crafted the narrative of this film for it to be generally accessible, you know, just recently I was talking to my producer in an interview and, you know, we we're basically trying to tell, a very kind of generic story, this, you know, career rise and fall story through the specific. So it's something that can be accessible to anybody who's an artist who's trying to follow a dream, but through these very eclectic and wonderful, humble characters who are the matches. So I'm wondering, I, I'm wondering if you and the band can chime in too, but um, have you heard from people who were not familiar with the band prior to seeing the film? Like what, what, what anybody said? Honestly, pretty much every review that's in print right now has been from someone who ha has not been a fan of the band. And um, I mean, not to pat myself on the back or anything, but like the reviews have been amazing. I mean, like, honestly, most people have entered in the film not knowing who the matches are. And they come out saying, oh, we like bought records. We, you know, downloaded from Spotify or whatever you do on Spotify and um, Apple Music. And so it's, you know, that was kind of the the master plan was to just try and open up the matches to an audience that might have loved them then and would love them now and you know can access them even though you know it's been a while since they've been an active regularly active band yeah well i think that just means that uh it's a success and you did a great job thank you um all right matt sorry was that too aggressive uh yeah. i want to like and again <laughs> anybody can answer these but i'm going to kind of pick a few people to start with um but let's talk about bosnia um i like i kind of want to see a full narrative film about a, <laughs> a, a bunch of high school kids that travel to a war-torn country to play music <laughs> for other teenagers like that's amazing like when i saw that it blew my mind um but i'm wondering what like um what are some things about that experience that affected you maybe even shaped part of your worldview in a way that most of us have never had access to well, definitely, I think for us, it was like probably what, 17, 18 year olds. I was probably 17. They were eight, Justin Chung, 18. I mean, to have that experience as a kind of a fluke, and as we tell in the movie, like kind of pulling it over on the people that brought us over, but getting to have that experience and see a completely to us random part of the world that had just gone through this horrific war and that music was kind of a thing that helped unify people after that and to get to be there and see it in the flesh was like, I think it had a profound effect on us. And also probably, I think, I know for me, it helped me realize like, oh, this is something that like, we could actually do for real. Um, Cause at that point we were just a high school garage band playing at our friends' parties and the school talent show and stuff. So it was a huge step towards seeing like, this is a real thing that we could actually do. Your dad really pulled the, uh, the wool over someone's eyes with that move, but 
<laughs> we, we learned we learned we got we learned so much from the band that we toured with over there too, oh, yeah. the Bosnian band, because they were like they were a serious like one of the the country's big like band exports at the time and they were professional yeah, and they were like oh my um, god you guys don't know yeah. what you're doing do you and and you know we <laughs> confessed like we really don't and uh it was it was cool huh. uh you know kind of making mistakes in front of big audiences and big crowds in like like high pressure situations on those stages but like in a way that would never get back to California or even the States really like, you know, I mean, th th that was the last time I ever wore a, a visor sideways, I think. <laughs> yeah. I don't know about that. You have to check also, the archives. I'll hold out hope. I'll hold out yeah, hope. Yeah. <laughs> and did real quick to go to your, your question about how the, the world's like, we were there and there's soldier, there was like, I think UN peacekeeping troops, but you see people walking around with AK-47s literally keeping the peace and we were there as young American teenagers and there's a bunch of people who did not like the United States or didn't like Western countries at that point because we're the ones walking down the streets with the AK-47s yeah. keeping the peace yeah. and so we were kind of like learning this situation where like some people were like we were being told were like swearing us and t saying bad things about us in Bosnia and that we had no idea what they were saying but we were just there to play music so it was interesting to like see that happen and be Part of that as well that's incredible i'd love to see more footage of that if you have any uh um yeah it was I super humbling <laughs> i wanted to say sorry i'm just like now i'm freaking out realizing i'm never going to get through these questions uh we get there we believe in you yeah what what was the do you remember what the earliest song you wrote together um you know maybe as the locals that landed on that first record and maybe this is different from the three of you and John, because I'm assuming that when you came aboard, you took what was there and then added to it. Um, yeah, those are the songs that had been written already. Yeah, and that, that the same thing kind of happened with us with Matt and Tony, because we had the songs and they were written with a bunch of people, but then when we recorded with them, they made them infinitely better. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, I'm just sort of curious from that first record, like what the earliest song was. Yeah, there were a number from, uh, I think, Chain Me Free, uh, Superman, which was on the first pressing that we took off uh, when we signed to Epitaph, and uh, the Jack Slap Cheer, Chain Me Free, and Superman were like our high school staples. Yeah, and then those, were, else those was... were ones we, we wrote like well before we were ever playing shows or touring. Those were like legit garage songs. Yeah. Kids. Yep. Kids playing music. <laughs> yep. I love it. Uh, <laughs> I was going to talk about Warp Tour, but I don't think we need to talk about Warp Tour. Um, I support that. <laughs> we're, we're, we made it out the other side. Yeah, yeah. I know. Well, I was just going to say that like playing Warp Tour in your late 30s is definitely no fun. Uh, <laughs> from my experience. Oh, shit. Um, but yeah, that, ex that explains that, that explains why like Fletcher was like putting me in a headlock for fun and stuff. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you got to numb the pain however you can. <laughs> it explains um, it explains the old dogs. Yeah, for sure. Uh, do you do you, do any of you re recall that Epitaph tour that first hangout? Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, because I don't, and I was sober, <laughs> but I still don't. Like the only thing I remember is like a tree growing in the middle of a stage somewhere in Texas. Does that sound familiar? The venue's uh, called Trees. Oh, uh, yeah. Explains it. Okay. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Not really a question. Hey, just sort of hey wait, wait, wait. <laughs> That's is the venue in... where there's there's that awesome uh, Nirvana footage. Yeah. Of the Nirvana video. Fighting the crowd in that venue. Yeah. Oh shoot. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, he's yeah. he's fight he fights the he gets in a fight with the the, the bouncer guy. Yeah, he like hits him with and his like, guitar. Dave Grohl jumps the drum set and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's crazy. Yeah, down in down in uh, deep deep Elm, right? That's it. Yep. Oh yeah. yeah. Fun uh, fact: Dallas. that Epitaph tour, though, that Epitaph tour is where I first learned of the matches because I went to go see your band, Justin, what? Ocean City. I know because that was my favorite band at the time. And then when the matches came, you know, literally tearing onto the stage, I was like, "Who's this band?" And then I think I had the same reaction you did, which is like, holy shit. And then yeah, yeah. here we are, I guess. <laughs> um, you know what, since we're running out of time, can we just talk about Don Sanchez for the remainder of the Q&A? <laughs> <laughs>
like, what what was his story? Was it like did everybody know um, uh, the that guy? Or was that something you just found after the fact? Which one? Uh, Don Sanchez. He was the the reporter. There's like a 30 second clip. Like oh, my oh my god! <laughs> uh, no, no. Uh, what's his name? I was like, like wait, what? Must, must know. know. Must burger. Must band. must be. Must be. Oh my god, that's so inside baseball. <laughs> no, it was like a weird. I love well, it. What happened was our we had a bus driver and he had a bunch of action figures and like we we're just like, why do you have an action figure of a news reporter? And so I don't know. And then it just kind of took on a life of its own. And... We we went kind of magical realism for a while. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It was like <laughs> right. some like weird third season stuff. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, all the Musburger <laughs> stuff hit the cutting room I, I, floor. <laughs> yeah. I still for, for, a, for a while John Devoto spoke only through Musburger. <laughs> I don't know I, what I, this uh, means, but every morning it. every morning is a part of my like, you know tune into the universe like i am musburger like i feel i feel what it's like i feel the essence of musburger Wait, for sure. musburger that was that was a that was a um hut sucker proxy right yeah no yeah, i think he, he was like a he was <laughs> like a college football <laughs> reporter or something no but i'm pretty to sure me, he was, was just an action figure that john carried around everywhere <laughs> Yeah. Musburger. I swear it's in a Coen Brothers film. Or maybe it was uh, Barton Fink. I don't know. Somebody keeps saying it, Musburger. It probably uh, is. Uh, <laughs> hey, you know what? And, you know, uh, okay. I just want to say that as much as I love the film, um, Justin, I think your parents stole the show. Yes, uh, I agree. I wanted to know if they were always like that or just when there's a camera in their faces and related. Do they have representation and what is their day rate? <laughs> oh, yeah. No, that's that's just that's just them. That's every every day, every dinner. It's great. I love it. <laughs> I feel very lucky that I get to witness be part of that and witness that on a, a regular occasion. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we're we almost we almost cut that scene, uh like cut into it so that we could reduce some of the back and forth. And then we were sitting there, we're like, no, this needs to live in full uncut um, <laughs> classic. We, we, yeah. <laughs> I've like, I've like stumbled upon Justin's dad at various times in my life, like in like a local grocery store or something like that. And he is talking about the band or the film to the, to the, the grocer that he's checking out with like he's so great. he's like our like main pr dude since yeah. we were since we were 14 he's told every single person he knows yeah no he's he's one of those people where like, we're you, like yeah you go you... dad we're trying to be punks come on stop it that's amazing this isn't how it works but i think it is how it works actually like he knows he knows somebody everywhere too like yeah you go you go into you go down in Safeway and he like knows the guy stocking the shelf. And then like, you know, you go to the restaurant and it's like, he just like everywhere he goes, he just talks to everybody like, like no yeah. holds bars. Just, yeah. like, he's, he's the one bringing like our signed photo down to the local pizza joint and stuff. You yeah. A hundred percent. Dan was San Susi knows no strangers. No. Um, yeah. uh, Justin. Well, sorry, I really like to be accusatory, like, <laughs> um, Justin, while I have you, um, I just want, you know, not to get too serious, but seeing that footage of the Japan promo hurt my soul. Um, like they said in the oh. film, I don't think I've ever seen you not smiling. And uh, coming back to that, um, uh, that, that, that first, uh, I watched one of the first Q&As that you did. And I think at the time, you all seem to have like a bit of PTSD having to relive the experience both on film and like fielding questions about the film. And my question I'm wondering now is that um, after a few more months have passed, if, you know, if being forced to relive it in this way has been cathartic at all now that more time has, you know, gone by. Yeah, I mean, especially that, like that scene specifically, like when I first saw it, it like really kind of messed me up a bit. You know, it really kind of took me back to that place and I was in like a pretty dark place at that time. Um, and uh it was it was weird i mean i mean looking back i'm like i i'm 
probably was being pretty petty. Um, it was just, yeah, man, I was <laughs> sorry. You could, you totally got me. <laughs> oh no. Yeah. Like, honestly, like when I, when I, when I, uh, saw that again, like I like had to leave and like take some time off and like before I could kind of come back to it. And then since then looking back, like I've been able to like process that more and like a lot of like the stuff I dealt with, like towards the, like the breakup and the end of the band and like me leaving, uh, I think I was able to kind of like, like work through it um, a bit. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know where I'm going with this. I, I could probably blabber on, but uh, if, yeah, I, just, I don't know. I guess I was curious I, it, to see if, if it has changed since like seven or several months ago when you first started, any of you like having had more time now that this has become a, a thing and you've been talking about it more, if it has gotten easier or if it's kind of still there, I guess was my question. Um, I don't know. I, I don't think I ever really like talked to the guys about like, what happened there or like why I was like so like I was so upset and what I I, I think I thought was going on there so maybe that maybe that's like a, a group therapy session that we can we can have Sorry. at some point if I can interject I I you know like I think I I I have been that guy in our band like but the whole time we've been a band um and I think <laughs> you know I used alcohol and stuff to to like to kill whatever it was that I was feeling so that I could be a weirdo freak. You know what I mean? And so I, I may have looked like I was okay, but I think on the inside, I, I was not. Um, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't know if this was going to get this dark. I just, uh, just <laughs> I'm just asking questions here, here. We'll, um, no, that was, I mean, that was like literally a videotape of like the beginning of the end, like for me, like I was just like off, off the cliff. And so, I think uh, it was it was uh, definitely very indicative of where I was at the time and like why I, think where, I kind of. I think where you were at though, I mean, you know, we could we could all relate. You were sort of the first one to to sort of snap and call it, you know, put yourself on the bench or say I'm out. But uh, you know, we all had our we were all reaching our breaking points with the situation. And we kind of, uh, you know, we didn't have a movie to watch the time to like have a sense of clarity about why things w didn't feel quite right, you know, but we just, you know, as you kind of see in the movie with like our, the foundation of the, of the band, like the whole idea that, uh, that, you know, we had a firm foundation or a cornerstone. We, we sort of like, built this really cool thing that was propped up by fans and it was sitting on sand being eroded, you know, mm -hmm. like we, we had no means to continue doing it as a business as we moved out of like the hobby range and the like your young adults, your parents will kind of like, you can like always lean back and eat your parents food and <laughs> crash on their couch if you need to. Once we got out of that, we had, there was nothing under that that we hadn't, we, yeah. And and uh, I think Justin was like realizing that I'm not to, not to minimize like anything that you were feeling to just that, but like that was a big realizing that we couldn't go on, that we had no means of going on was was tough. And in fact, actually, Justin kind of like getting to his breaking point was sort of what got the rest of us there. But we were all heading there. We were gonna get there. That's so you know? wild that you say that because I like just this last time I watched the movie, I. I've been noticing it, but now I've really noticed it. Like there are so many similarities, I think, between your band and my band in that with us, Tony was the first one where he just like, I think we 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 booked that last Fatal Warp tour and he was like, no, no. <laughs> and so, yeah. but, but he already had, you know, stuff going on and he just needed to get out of there for his own sanity. And then, um, yeah, and then like the rest of us were a few years behind and then it was like, oh, you can just be done. That's great. It was, it was yeah. able to breathe again, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Whoa. Can yeah. stop something? Whoa. <laughs> uh, yeah. Chelsea. Yes. I, I know I've talked to you about the fact that you worked on this film for what feels like several decades, uh, yes. just to have it start to come out during a global pandemic. And I'm not sure how your feelings have changed since we first talked about this um, earlier this year, but I... 
I guess I have to say I didn't realize how much I missed live music until seeing this film. And and if someone like me who rarely notices most things in his field of vision can have a moment of clarity like that, I'll bet Matches fans who have been hungry for this shit are just fucking ecstatic. Um, and I'd also um, I'm just gonna, but I guess um, I guess my question is: Have you found uh, a way forward? You know, from the initial despair <laughs> that you felt, you know, kind of working on something for so long, and then like wait this is when it's supposed to happen and it's yeah you know um i think the thing that got me through the pandemic was the fact that we did actually have a world premiere and i mean that night was magical we had all the guys there they played a little secret show and, and you know the film got a standing ovation which had me crying and still makes me cry when i think about it so i'm not going to talk about it too much um but uh it was it was magical and i got to hold on to that but I mean, but basically the rest of my year was robbed of that like energy exchange experience of seeing uh, the film uh, with an audience, a live audience in a theater. And I still like, I mean, I spent like three months in a deep dark depression grieving it, but you know, seeing these new like um, virtual festival options and with great festivals like Sound Unseen who are really trying to, you know, get filmmakers an audience um, in any way that we can despite the pandemic. Um, it was an opportunity we just felt like we had to take, you know, I didn't want to hold on to this film anymore. You know, it's like, it's been in me for so long. I just want the world to have it, you know? And so anything we could do to start kind of navigating these waters and seeing how to bring the film to an audience is we wanted to jump on it. And so we did, and it's been great. I mean, the film has been doing very well on the virtual festival circuit and, you know, we're kind of taking a break for the holidays and then hopefully we can jump back in in the spring and then hopefully we can get it up on a streaming platform like a Netflix or a Hulu so that even more people can uh, watch it. So, well, we'll see, but you know, it's been, I mean, it's, it's different, um, but you know, it's, it's not the same as being in a sweaty, sh you know, sweaty room full of fans, you know, jumping yeah. around, but well, you know. The thing is with the matches, it's like, it, it, the, it's the community aspect is so core to what like all of this is. And then to have that, like if, to have it impossible to happen is just, it's, yeah, it just sucks. Basically, it does. It does suck. But you know what? Yeah. This is great because otherwise, well, yeah, yeah. I don't know if we'd be able to do this. You know, like True. what we're doing right now. Like this is pretty fucking cool. You know. So. Right on. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get. Wait, my watch isn't on the hand. I don't know why I did that. Um, <laughs> but here's something kind of for the band, but also for uh, just because I don't know if I've asked them directly, but Sean and John maybe more so. But um, something I've been trying to articulate for myself over the past few years. Um, but I think this applies to you as well. Do you think having had success, however you define it, uh, because let's be honest, how many bands get to say that they, you know, signed to a very artist friendly label like Epitaph and were allowed the opportunity to tour the world for however brief amount of time, having had some success after the initial resolution of the band, uh, in both our cases are, are we back? Are we not back? Are we somewhere in between? What's going on? But more importantly, um, Having taken time away, f uh, sorry, 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 I lost my spot. Having taken time away from the thing that you've been known for primarily and then doing something else. And, you know, again, this is more maybe for Sean and John in terms of starting new bands um, and musical adventures that it, um, did you find it much more freeing to not, it's uh, much more freeing to be able to create when you no longer had to chase whatever the fuck it was we all felt we had to chase for so long? or no. Hmm. Maybe I'm just projecting. <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah, I, I, there was a period of time. I mean, there's been a, I've had a few like arcs in terms of how I think about music since the matches. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, yeah, initially it was freeing to be like, okay, I, I can, I can make an album without crash cymbals or distortion on guitars. And like, a, if, people don't like it well then they can not like this band as opposed to like ruin the matches by doing that <laughs> yeah okay. um but but like after that initial like oh cool i can make an album that sounds like prince or something like that like the sort of the boundaries of music and like what what genre was uh kind of like flaked away uh, to to some degree like to a to a huge degree actually to the point that now like I don't know, I, I, I get the sense that this is happening to everyone all at once just because we have such insanely large 
music collections now because we all share everything on streaming if we subscribe to those type of places um like you no longer have to like invest in your like cool ska collection like it, it doesn't cost <laughs> more money to like to like heavy metal and ska at the same time you know what i mean mm. uh i just like i've sort of uh you know i don't know like i listen to like the most centrist like cardi b and then at the same time like the weirdest noisy indie bands at the exact same time like and it all sounds like music to me now whereas when i was in the matches i was like hate that hate that love that that's this mm. this is music that's not music i was very like very picky i think it was maybe because i was defining who i wanted to be and it's actually really useful when you're defining yourself right to like be like i that doesn't appeal to me so i'm not going to do any of that this I love. I'm going to kind of mimic or take things from, you know, Motion City Soundtrack or the Pixies or whatever it is that I like about the bands that I like and throw every and, t and just hate everything else so that I don't go there. So I don't like make a Kylie Minogue record or whatever. But now I'm like, I like all of the things. Uh, I don't know. I, I think that makes I don't sense. know if I answered your question. <laughs> yeah, I don't know either. I think I, I realized that I was saying more about myself than asking you about yourself, which is because I'm an egomaniac and a narcissist. And well, I just gave you uh, an egomaniac's <laughs> answer. <yeah>. So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, John, do you have anything you want to add about like your experience with music after? Totally. Yeah. <laughs> I think um, the band that I did after the matches was like actually me trying to stay on that same path mm -hmm. like still being like unwilling to change direction i actually um worked with our manager the manager that the matches had for many years um the entire career um worked with him for like a year a year and a half tried to get a record deal as it was like apparent that the record industry was like crumbling and it's not a good time to try to get a record deal but I think I was just still stuck in this mindset and not ready to shift um eventually I realized like I was beating a dead horse trying to do trying to tour trying to um trying to make like pop punk influenced music um it didn't feel like the right thing and started to play with other people who were um into some really weird stuff like electronic -y, like jazz like there's no beat and everything's keyboards and like weird synthesizer sounds and kind of went that route for a couple years um and like these days my main music stuff is like i tap dance more than i play guitar like i tap dance and sing more than i play guitar um so that's like not the matches at all but i think like back to your question of like are we back are we somewhere in the middle you know it's probably somewhere in the middle where like it's really fun to come back to and it's like riding a bike where we where we can just like you know pick up our matches instruments and plug into our matches tones and the songs are like still there right i'm really excited um, I'm sorry. You see my eyes? Like I got really excited. Um, I'm, I'm, I didn't mean to, to to cut in, but we do have only a few minutes, and I want to talk more about me. Um, but uh, but but for real, um, shit, something. Yeah, uh, life of a match is probably one of my favorite. Is probably my new. I think it might be my favorite song that you've done, and that happened later. Oh, thanks. Thanks for being in our video for that. Sorry we didn't ask you before we put oh, you no. in. Oh no. Great. <laughs> I mean, you know. It, uh, that and also that is just like it is so emotional like fuck, you know what i think i think i got to close it down now and i'm sorry i i started with 50 questions i think i asked six but Amazing. um <laughs> but here's here's what i'll say and that kind of ties into this a little bit in that like you know i i assume that like when the pressure's off whatever that pressure is imaginary or real it's just i think the point i was trying to get at is there is a freedom in that when you don't have to worry about things and so you know should you know i have no idea what motion city is headed for or not headed for but if you know we choose to do other things then it's just it's just great to know that it doesn't matter like we can do whatever we want whenever we want and however we want and i guess yeah. that's that's kind of more so what i was getting at but if i can close out here with a little statement okay let me just this is what i got so um i'm dreading sharing this uh 
a little bit because I may start weeping. But, um, but that tells me that I absolutely must share it. So here goes. I was texting with Chelsea last night and I told her how earlier in the day I was telling my wife how much I love this film and how it is so important to me because the whole time frame of the 2000s is like gone from my memory due to me constantly trying to keep my feelings buried under a heavy layer of, you know, drugs and alcohol. And out of nowhere, as I was telling my wife this, I started convulsively crying, like uncontrollably crying for like 15 minutes crying yesterday at noon. And I could not stop. And then, and then as I was texting Chelsea last night about that, I started doing it again. And I, and I'm just like, what is going on? And, and something between that and also the song life of a match, um, which is perhaps one of the most beautiful songs ever written, not hyperbole. Um, and the lyrics have been spinning around in my head for weeks. And I, this is going to be embarrassing to you and me, but for everyone else, the lyrics, the chorus that don't you ever wish our generation made anything worth saving, made anything to last longer than the life of a match. And fuck. <laughs> but the weight of it all is just hitting me really hard now. Um, especially so seeing as I, you know, I missed out on arguably the best moment of my own musical career by, you know, not being present. And so I just want to thank all of you for creating this truly therapeutic artifact and allowing me to process my own grief through it. Because in the end, all we really have is the moment and the memories of the people we shared it with. So with that, I'd like to say, when does record number four drop? And uh, also, would anyone out there have any interest in Motion City Soundtrack and the matches touring, let's say 2022 after the pandemic is over? Because uh, feel free to inundate us if you are. like. Whatever. Um, that's Sounds it. Like fun. <laughs> um, Jesus, dear. <laughs> thank, thank you, Justin. You everybody, and uh, stay present. <laughs>